to uh, our presentations. It is a great pleasure to host Dr. Lisa Morton today, one of the best research colleagues I have ever had and a clinical psychologist I really admire. Dr. Lisa Morton is a chartered counseling psychologist and a member of the British Psychological Society's Counseling Psychology Division. Lisa is also registered with the Health and Care Professions Council and uh, with more than 10 years experience of working in an adult mental health team in the NHS and the further five years in private practice. Lisa has extensive experience of working with adults undergoing a wide variety of mental health and life issues, which obviously uh, makes Lisa one of the best presenters to uh, present her uh, topic, Psychologically Informed Medicine. Lisa holds various positions and has received many awards. Some of them are uh, from the Strathclyde University Images of Research Impact Award 2019, British uh, Heart Foundation Heart Hero Award 2012, uh, ESRC funded postdoctoral research fellowship back in 2003. And uh, Lisa is also uh, a member of the British Heart Foundation Healthcare Professional Alliance uh, Council and also a member of the Kinsey Institute Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. As a member, she sits on the Scottish Congenital Cardiac Advisory Board, NHS. Scotland. Uh, Lisa is also uh, sitting on the Scottish Obstructive uh, Cardiac Network, SOCN for NHS Scotland, on the Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the working group developing cardiac heart uh, conditions, healthcare standards, Heart Disease and Stroke Cross Party Group, the Scottish Parliament member. Uh, she's a member of the management team of the Summerville Foundation, a member of international group developing standards of, for clinical holding of children during medical procedures in Edge Hill University. And uh, as a patient, uh, she is involved in patient uh, involvement network member for long-term conditions alliance. So. We have many, many reasons to listen to uh, Lisa's presentation today, and I'm really excited to see uh, the continuation. Before we go uh, to Lisa's presentation, I would like to inform uh, about uh, the in and out of uh, today's presentation and uh, to help you uh, express any questions you may have. So please note that you can use the public chat for comments, responding to questions and live interactions through this webinar. And uh, please use the Q&A to ask questions to the presenter. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please log out and log back uh, as in the first uh, step you did. So enjoy the presentation uh, as uh, I'm going to, uh, to do. And uh, Lisa, the panel is yours. And actually I will stop sharing for you to be able to share your screen. Thanks. Thank you, Manos. Um, okay, does that, does that work okay? Yes, yes. yes. Right. So thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and thanks again to Manos for extending the invitation. I've been working with Manos for a few years and um, I'm honoured to hold an um, honorary research fellowship at the University of Suffolk over the last few years as well. So today I'm going to talk about psychologically informed medicine. So just before we start, I will be discussing medical trauma in children and adults, and that may well be a personal issue for some of you. So please do be aware of your own reactions and do what you need to take care of yourself. So that might be turning this off or kind of switching off for a bit, but just whatever you need to do. 
So in addition to, to what um, Manos um, has been talking about, I am an expert by experience in this area. So I was born with a cardiac condition and when I was 11 days old, I was fitted with a cardiac pacemaker. That was a world first at the time, back in 1978. And it was done at Black Hill Hospital in Glasgow. Since then, um, I have depended on pioneering medical treatment and um, encountered many different medical interventions being in and out of hospital um, since childhood. And early pacemakers were physically limiting as well. So the heart rate couldn't go up or down. It was just a fixed rate. So until I was 12, that was quite limiting physically as well. So I wasn't able to take part in things like gym and um, gym classes at school, horse riding lessons or active play. By the time I was seven years old, I had been fitted with five different pacing devices by thoracotomy. So that's when they break the ribs and put the, the device straight onto the heart. My prognosis was uncertain. Um, so we didn't know um, kind of until my teens kind of what survival was like as a pioneering patient. And I faced lifelong psychosocial barriers. I had open heart surgery when I was 12 years old to repair a hole in my heart. And at that point, I was given my first variable rate pacemaker. So that meant that my heart could now um, vary depending on the physiological needs of my body, which was more um, kind of physiologically responsive. So I could be more active. I was fitted with my 11th pacemaker a few years back, and that involved um, a two month wait because of the complexity involved because I've had so many devices and so much hardware has been left in place. So and a month of that was in the hospital um, and it was over the summer holidays, so that impacted on the whole family. I've had countless issues with adult care provision. So since um, reaching adulthood, when I reached adulthood, there wasn't a specialist service for adults. Um, and as a kind of pioneering patient, we've had to kind of pave the way there. So I've had lots of issues, but particularly around accessing appropriate care in emergencies um, and during pregnancy. I've always lived as full a life as possible, but I've always felt a lack of psychological support. When I was 17, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and at that point in the kind of 90s, there wasn't really any treatment available. And I just kind of had to experience the flashbacks and nightmares along with the other sort of symptoms that I had. But I did elect to go for private treatment when I was in my early 30s. Um, I attended the body psychotherapist that I found extremely beneficial. So I have, I, I'm qualified as a chartered counselling psychologist and I do work in independent practice um, over the last five or six years. Before that, I worked for 10 years in the NHS. And I also have a PhD by research and I'm, I'm quite active um, in terms of research. Um, and as Mano said at the moment, I've got honorary positions at the University of Glasgow and the University of Suffolk. So you can see here, there is an abstract um, and I'm the 11 day old baby in this early study that was published in the eighties. Um, and these were kind of the first babies to be fitted uh, with cardiac devices. So in terms of congenital heart disease, the prevalence and prognosis are that around about 1% of babies will be born with a heart condition. And that's a very heterogeneous group. So um, some of those babies will have quite a simple defect, whereas others will have much more complex defects. And around 90% of those babies will now survive into adulthood. And that compares with just 20% in the 40s. So there's no cure for congenital heart conditions and lifelong monitoring is now recommended. And there is an increased mortality and morbidity burden. In terms of mental health, um, we now know from quite a large body of evidence that the lifetime prevalence of depression, anxiety and PTSD for adults with a congenital heart condition is around 50%. So this is significantly higher than the general population. And 69% of individuals who meet diagnostic criteria for a mood disorder are not engaged in mental health treatment. So many of these individuals are suffering silently and worrying alone. Yet we know that PTSD is a risk factor for cardiac disease in itself. And we also know that if somebody is experiencing depression or PTSD, they're less likely to comply with doctor recommendations. So this is a two way issue. So I like this um, meme that you might have seen that went round in social media and it was really kind of trying to in, in capture kind of I think it was after the fires in Australia that how 
if all of the trees were burnt down and, and you found a little koala looking for its, its environment um, okay. and, and you found it in a very shocked and state in traumatized state, um, you might say, well, this koala has a mental health problem. But actually, you might want to understand why. So it says the koala has a number of needs after surviving an atrocity of which mental health might be the outcome. But it's really important that we have a comprehensive understanding of what has happened to this little koala to prevent tragedy. Um, but we also need to, to, to recognise that the mental health difficulties that that the koala is facing, um, but the wider um, context, or we will compound injustice. So this is very much where I'm coming from, and you might recognise that that book cover there is from James and Joyce Robertson, who were pioneers for um, young children in hospital back in the 1950s. And you might have seen some of their videos, which are really famous within psychology, um, on young children in hospital. But they were the first people to really note that um, young children needed caregivers. And, and this was around about the work of James Bowlby. And at that point, it was common practice for children to be left in the hospital and visit, visited once a week by their parents. And it was discouraged for parents to stay with their children because it was seen as unsettling them. We now understand that actually that's incredibly damaging. And that led to something called the Platt Report, which in which um, James and Joyce Robertson recommended significant changes. So if we look at the broader context in terms of trauma, and in this context, medical trauma, I'm interested in, well, there are parts of this story that we can't change. These babies, children, adults, we might have to undergo complex medical interventions and surgeries and invasive procedures, but there are other things that we probably can change. So what are the risk factors? Um, how can we mitigate them? And how can we enhance protective factors to improve these psychological outcomes? So we know from the literature of generally in trauma that childhood adversity increases our risk. Previous health or mental health issues, poor social support during or after the traumatic experience, perceived life threat, feeling powerless at the time, background life stressors, and also repeated exposure. So this is cumulative. So all of these things increase risk of developing mental health problems following exposure to a traumatic life event. There are also things that we know that are protective. So good social support, feeling some level of being in control, help seeking, meaning seeking, so finding some meaning out of what has happened, resilience and coping skills, emotional release, and appropriate psychological support. So if we think about this, then from kind of looking at the literature, if we think about congenital heart disease, you almost have the protective, the, sorry, the perfect storm of risk factors, um, if you think about that list of risk factors that we just mentioned. So repeated exposure and life threat, so you might be in pediatric intensive care and then in intensive care as an adult or a child. Um, there might be repeated trips to being blue lighted to a &E, medical interventions, surgeries, cardiac events, so things like um, arrhythmias, um, cardiac arrest, cardiac devices, learning to live with a cardiac device. If you have an ICD, ICD shock, uh, facing transplant or concerns about that um, and living with an uncertain prognosis. In terms of powerlessness, so there are many disempowering aspects of care when you're a patient, so being in the patient role, wearing a hospital gown, being held for clinical procedures, waiting across the patient journey, medical uncertainty, having issues accessing appropriate care and parental overprotection. And then if we look at social support, so medical disruptions to attachment, um, and these might be things like being in an incubator, maybe not be, um, being able to be fed, so you might need a kind of gastro tube, um, so not being able to help, not being, being touched. Also mental health um, issues among parents, obviously um, having a poorly baby can affect, and we know that it affects mental health um, of parents who, who are more likely to experience post-traumatic stress too. Feeling different um, across the life journey, and this is something that comes up time and time again in the literature, scarring, body image, bullying and ableism can all be barriers to accessing social adequate social support. And one of the things about social support is very often throughout the life journey, we gain social support from our peers, because usually our peers are going through similar experiences, 
But CHD is uni uniquely isolating because it's quite unlikely that your peers are also facing the same um, experiences across the lifespan. So it's, it's quite unlikely that somebody else in your class at school is also going through a cardiac surgery or is facing that or is living with a pacemaker. So you just don't have that same peer support. And then background life stressors. So there's a variety of background life stressors that are quite unique to this population. So lifelong consider, um, having to think about things like increased mortality, awareness of mortality from an early age. Um, so not really having kind of that sort of protective um, upbringing where, where you, you don't really think about these things. Um, that increased morbidity burden, so physical symptoms, physical lim limitations, and the impact of that on education, career and finances, all of which we know from the literature is significant. Also the impact on relationships and having to think about things like genetic counselling, um, having a family, and if you do, um, you know, if, if, how can we, any physical limitations may impact on that. So, what I think, what my you know, research and interest is, well, how can we mitigate those risk factors and how can we promote protective factors to improve mental health outcomes for this growing population? And we know from the literature that our kind of window of tolerance for detecting threat is narrowed, often narrowed by early adversity. So in effect, that means that our kind of body's alarm system for threat goes off easier if we're raised in a hostile environment. So this is true for any early adversity, not just medical. But we also know that people who have experienced trauma often report positive adaptation, and that can include increased resilience, a deeper appreciation of life, closer relationships, more empathy and personal strength. So mental health difficulties and positive adaptation and post-traumatic growth are not mutually exclusive. So you might find um, that the very same person may have be experiencing mental health difficulties, but also um, is demonstrating positive adaptation and increased resilience. And sometimes that masks the mental health problems. So from this, this is what I've termed psychologically informed medicine. And this really is more, it's, it's an approach to try to address these factors so that we can better mitigate risks, but also improve um, uh, protective factors. And there are different kind of components to this. So considers promoting social inclusion, promoting compassionate um, communication skills. So, you know, often within the, the medical profession, communication skills are often just considered bedside manner or soft skills and aren't really given the importance that, that, that they should be. Um, whereas th there's a growing body of evidence uh, that even just kind of looking a patient in the eye um, and being more compassionate improves outcomes. So making sure that, that really the importance of communication skills is embedded within training and CPD. Promoting soothing presence across the patient journey, so making sure that parents are allowed to, to be with their child, that that's very much promoted, that touch. Um, and we know from studies, um, so for example, Field et al have done studies that have demonstrated that peer, um, preterm infants put on more weight and are more likely to survive if they can hear mum's voice and if they're touched by mum. And there are more recent studies that have shown um, that pain levels are lower in babies, preterm babies, and, and stress levels are lower when they can hear their, their parent and, and kind of when there's touch involved as well. So promoting that across the patient journey. Trauma-informed practice, so addressing disempowering aspects of care, so things like the hospital gown, clinical holding. And promoting a healing environment. So there's a lot of things about the, the kind of medical setting itself um, that are obviously very clinical and obviously a lot of that is necessary in terms of hygiene. Um, but there are things that we could rethink. So there's often very harsh lighting, it's very noisy, there's kind of beeping of multiple monitors, all of which is not necessarily conducive to promoting a kind of healing environment, which is required for recovery and embedding psychological support. So I, I very much advocate for psychologists to be a core part of um, teams. So that was my work up until COVID hit um, and considerations. And then suddenly we had this new risk factor of COVID-19. And it very quickly became apparent that while there was kind of narratives that COVID-19 um, was kind of the great equaliser. In fact, it's actually intensifying health inequalities. 
And we know that there is increased risk of serious complications for people with complex congenital heart conditions. And many of us, including myself, were recommended to socially shield or to vigilantly socially distance. And we know from the Office of National Statistics that about half of adults with an underlying health condition report that their well-being has been affected, their anxiety is higher and they're concerned about the future. And the gaps already pre-COVID, there was gaps in income and that is only getting wider. There's a negative impact of mental health on quarantining and sh shielding. And one particular study showed that there was disruption to cardiac care during the pandemic. So Concerns about infection, higher levels of psychological distress were also reported across the lifespan. So that was both children and adults. So what we did was we conducted a study and this was at Strathclyde University and it's in collaboration with the Kinsey Institute. Um, so this was with Nicola Cogan at Strathclyde um, and some of our students there and um, Yakek Kolax at the, the Kinsey Institute over in the States. And we looked at the an exploration of psychological trauma and positive adaptation in adults with CHD. And the reason we did this is because I felt from my own experience that while CH, eh, the kind of COVID was this increased risk factor, as a population, actually, in some ways, we were better prepared to deal with COVID than the general population, because we are a population who are used to dealing with medical uncertainty lifelong. So actually, maybe there were lessons that could be learned from this population too, in terms of positive adaptation. So 236 people completed our survey, and from that, around over half reported changes to their care. 86% reported the pandemic had made them more aware of their congenital heart condition. 68% said it was more, it made um, the pandemic more difficult for them, and 57% said it had helped them to cope. And you can see there's a bit of an overlap there, so it's not one or the other, so in some ways it might have made it more difficult, and in some ways it might have helped them cope better. Of our cohort, about 38% were medically advised to shield, but interestingly, 55% were. So some people had chosen to shield um, without that being recommended. So that kind of shows this is an expert group of patients who are taking this decision on the more, their own. Most of our people, so 93% um, who, who completed it, were under the care of a specialist centre. And concerningly, 30% of our participants met the cutoff for a PTSD screening measure. Um, that we had added. So that's nearly a third. Uh, we also completed a couple of regression analyses just to, so we had a, a series of psychosocial measures that looked at traumatic experiences but also protective factors and we looked at the relationships between them and the only ones that came out significant were that there was a link between regulation of emotion and I'll explain a little bit later what that means but being able to regulate your emotions um, helped and, and was associated with increased post-traumatic growth. And the post-traumatic growth measure is, is split up. So in particular, post-strength, um, post-traumatic growth strength and appreciation, so sense of appreciation, um, were connected with that. We also had a couple of open-ended questions where we asked people to firstly detail any thoughts they had about the impact of COVID-19 on their mental health and wellbeing. And 144 participants um, chose to, to respond to this. And there were some themes that came out of this. So the most common theme was um, people talking about anxieties in general, then CHD specific concerns. And then thirdly, 10% um, of people elected to discuss social isolation. And then 9% it was their frustrations with media and government ha handling. So you can see some of the quotes there. Um, so quite powerful quotes. So my mental health has definitely declined. It's brought up a lot of unresolved issues stemming from my illness as a child. Being in the shielding group contributed to this. I feel as if we've been forgotten. I feel like I'm in prison for a crime I didn't commit. It's made me more aware of my condition, the potential to lose my job and my life and it's shut me off from my usual support networks, which in turn has made me feel alone. The second question we asked was specific about the way the media had portrayed people with underlying health conditions, because this was something um, that seemed to me from the very start was quite um, tricky and difficult, you know, as somebody with underlying health condition to be bombarded with headlines such as, you know, what about herd immunity? Um, you know, will we just let it run riot? Um, will we just kind of see kind of survival of the fittest? Will we just have corona 
any lockdowns for the old, so there was this assumption that it was just older people at underlying health conditions. Anytime anybody kind of died, the first question was, but did they have an underlying health condition? So 211 participants responded to this, um, and you can see almost 80% of them felt that there had been, a, uh, the responses in the media was, the representation in the media was unfair to people with underlying health conditions. So just a couple of example quotes. I felt like people with underlying health conditions were assumed to be frail or have a lower quality of life. Like it wasn't bad if we die compared to the rest of the population. And it feels like people with underlying health conditions are to blame for their increased risk, like the condition is their fault and they're unimportant in society. So just to conclude, um, emotional regulation uh, from that study we'd found was associated with post-traumatic growth. Emotional regulation is the ability to monitor, evaluate and modify our emotions, and it is fundamental to our everyday functioning. So, for example, it's awareness and tolerance of our feelings, being able to identify and label them, being able to recognise patterns and being able to manage them appropriately. And this is a skill that can actually be fostered. So we could embed emotional regulation skills within treatment um, to help to promote positive adaptation for the congenital heart community, if this is something that fosters positive adaptation. We also found that health adversity was associated with, with greater appreciation as well. So by that, I mean, the more health adversity somebody faced, the more appreciative they were. Um, and that's an interesting finding in itself. And obviously it does indicate that there is positive adaptation there. But I think it's important that we kind of interpret that with caution because this is a population who are very often told to be grateful for their lives um, you know, from early childhood. Our findings also suggested that this population are at an increased risk of PTSD and that that's perhaps being exacerbated. So it's important that this is picked up. And a variety of anxieties and concerns about the impact of the pandemic in relation to their con congenital condition and beyond were reported. It's really important that public health and mainstream media messages about people with underlying health conditions is better addressed and improved to avoid margin marginalisation and ableism. So together we recommend a growth focused psychologically trauma informed approach to both medicine and public health that recognises the importance of promoting mental health and wellbeing during the pandemic and beyond. And that particular piece of work has been submitted um, and is currently under review and you can view a preprint. Um, and I'll give you a link at the end to my website, which has got all of the links to all of the articles that I mentioned here, um, if you're interested in that. So I'm just going to briefly mention another study that we did, and this was with um, MANOS. Um, so this was a collaboration between the University of Strathclyde and the University of Suffolk. And this was Nicola and our students and MANOS um, that um, completed this study. And this was a multi-method study. So in the first phase, we interviewed 10 participants, all with congenital heart conditions, and asked them um, about the kind of impact of hospital gowns on their well-being. And we then completed a follow-up study that was an online survey, and that was open to anybody um, because we had published an article in the conversation following the first phase, and it became apparent from the popularity of, of that article that this was a much broader issue. So from the quantitative collection, data collection, we found that in thematic analysis, there was three main themes that people associated wearing the hospital gown with. And that was symbolic embodiment of the sick role. So going into the sick role as soon as they put the gown on, feeling emotionally and physically vulnerable, and also just handing control over to medical professionals. And the second part of the study, we had found um, that we had almost 2,000 people completed this. Um, sort of, I think it's almost 1,000 people, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, you can see there was some media interest in that as well. And this has all been published in the Journal of Health and it's open access, so you can view that. So of that nearly 1,000 people that completed the survey, 64% struggled to put the gown on, 70% said it didn't fit them, 58% said it limited activity, 60% said um, that they didn't feel it was medically necessary, 70% and said influenced how they saw themselves and 41% said they were given a second gown to put on the other way round, which kind of defeats the purpose. So if you're interested in that survey, um, have a little look at that article. 
This is another piece of work that I'm involved in, and this um, is led by Professor Lucy Bray, who is at Edge Hill University. And Lucy um, has done some fantastic research, which demonstrated, um, which looked at the instance of clinical holding. So that's kind of physically holding children for medical procedures. And what Lucy found was that despite this, um, in recommendations, this, is, this should be the last resort. But what she found was that 81% of medical professionals were reporting that children were being forcefully held, often by their parents, for medical procedures, either frequently or very frequently, to get medical procedures done quickly, despite potentially causing them to become scared of future procedures and contributing to post-traumatic stress. So what Lucy did was she set up an international collaborative um, that I'm, I'm very privileged to be part of, where we're developing rights-based standards for children undergoing clinical procedures. And it's developing recommendations um, that no, kind of acknowledge children's rights. So this is called I Support. Um, it's currently out for public consultation. And uh, there's just an example here of some of the rights that we've spoken about. So we've kind of, there's like a version for medical professionals, but there's also a version for children and there's, there's things for children to, to, to fill in so that they can fill in their own preferences, what they would like, if that's holding mum's hand, if that's um, kind of being distracted uh, and, and also kind of what kind of sig signal that they might make if they want to stop um, so that they're empowered and involved in what is happening. And this is another uh, study that I'm involved in as well. Um, so I've been leading on the development of a measure of psychological safety. So this is with Professor Stephen Porges, who is the founder of what you may have heard of as polyvagal theory. Um, so this is, is a very kind of popular um, understanding really of kind of science of safety, understanding of trauma. So it really has revolutionized our understanding of trauma. And Stephen Porges talks a lot about psychological safety and he's actually just published a new book on psychological safety. Um, but in contact with, with Steve, we found that there was no standardised measure of psychological safety that comprises psychological, relational and physiological components. So myself and Nicola Cogan and our students uh, at the University of Strathclyde with Steve Porges and um, his postdoc Yaket Kolaks at the Kinsey Institute over in Uni Indiana University over the last few years have been developing a measure of psychological safety. And what we have done so far is um, to develop a measure that has consistent factor structure and internal consistency. So we've done kind of initial psychometric testing and we now have so we've completed item production. Um, so we had kind of stakeholders who, using the Delphi meth method, um, were experts within kind of psychology, so trained kind of clinicians, um, were experts in trauma, experts in um, post-traumatic, um, sorry, yeah, post-traumatic stress and, and polyvagal theory. And what we did was we came up with a lot of items um, and we used the Delphi, Delphi method. And, then, and through, through that, um, we had two studies where we performed item reduction and factor analysis. And we have developed this 29 item measure of the neuroception of psychological safety scales, what we've called it. And it has subscales. So there are three subscales. And so they are compassion, social engagement and body sensations. Um, and we've just written up this piece of work and submitted it for review. And um, we've also just published a preprint. So again, there's a link to that on my website if you're interested in this work. And what we hope is that this can be used in clinical and research practice, because often what happens is in trauma work, we look at pathological signs and symptoms. So we wait until there's pathology and a lot of the measurements are about measures of post-traumatic stress. Um, but what we wanted was actually before that, how do we measure feeling safe? How can we enhance protective factors if we are only measuring pathology? So we hope that this um, will fit that gap as well. So this is just an example and um, just to show you the scale itself so you can see um, some of the items that came up are things like I felt valued, I felt accepted, I felt understood um, and then some of the ones around compassion are things like um, there was someone I could trust or someone that made me feel safe and then we've got the kind of more physiological ones so things like my body felt relaxed, my face felt relaxed, my breathing was steady. So again you can have a little look at that if you're interested. 
And I thought I would just nod to, to these couple of um, pieces that I've had published over the last year. So one was about ableism in the psychology profession, um, because this kind of is something that I've become more and more aware of. And when I looked into this, I found that um, one study reported that compared to healthy adults, even amongst um, the healthiest adults with CHD, there are significant decrements in life expectancy, employment and lifetime earnings. So within the congenital heart community, um, there are decrements in employment and lifetime earnings. And I started to look at this particularly within my own field, which is psychology. And I found that only, I think it was 4% of academic psychologists and 3% of practitioner psychologists self-identify with a disability. So grossly underrepresented given that I think about 20% of adults live with an underlying health condition. Um, so um, this is something that I kind of had an article published in The Psychologist is almost a kind of call to action there. And that again is open access if you're interested. And I also had a blog published in the BMJ and that was actually more reflecting um, if you think back to the psychologically informed medicine and you think about the disempowering aspects of care. And my personal experience is one of the most disempowering aspects of care across the patient journey is waiting. So we wait as patients, we wait for kind of phone calls from doctors, we wait for appointments, we wait at appointments, we wait in outpatients, we wait for porters to come and take us for procedures, we wait for results. And often these are lengthy waits over which we have no control. And um, so again, this was just kind of a discussion of this and a kind of call, um, I guess, to understand that actually this was incredibly disempowering and, and it is something um, that should be kind of maybe better addressed as possible. You'll also see a little photograph there of our Scarred for Life um, photography exhibition. So that was a good few years ago and this was an exhibition that we had to challenge perceptions about scars and also to try and raise awareness about this kind of hidden CHD population and it was launched um, here at Kelvin Grove Art Gallery um, and it was kind of widely kind of in, in the mainstream media and toured around Scotland and then actually replicated across the UK. So just to touch on some of my more kind of advocacy type work, um, which is kind of other strand of all of this. So I petitioned the Scottish Parliament back in 2012, asking for improved care for people like myself who had congenital heart conditions. And this was following um, a couple of life-threatening incidents with my own care. And unbeknownst to myself, that was recorded and reported on the BBC um, news and STV News and also Holyrood Magazine, which is the Scottish Parliament's magazine. And following that, I ended up joining um, up with the Somerville Foundation, which is the leading charity supporting adults with a lifelong heart condition and um, really kind of embarked on trying to, to improve care. And there was the NHS did get on board and, uh, and kind of set up a series of kind of health boards, including the Scottish Congenital Cardiac Advisory Board, which I sat on. And um, part of the remit there was to develop healthcare standards for this population. So standards were eventually issued in January of 2018, which was a huge step forward and the first time that we have had standards uh, for this population. And they are for kind of national care. We're still working on ones for local care, so we have a sort of a, um, a kind of a hybrid model where you've got kind of specialist care at specialist centre, but also working um, with kind of more local care providers, and it's important that that's kind of done effectively. So we're working with Health Improvement Scotland, and that's unfortunately been halted due to, to COVID, um, but we're still working on that. Since then, SACS, which is our adult congenital cardiac service, has grown exponentially. We now have five consultant cardiologists, 4.2 whole-time equivalent specialist nurses. And I was delighted to find out that this year, funding for a specialist psychologist was designated for the service as well, which is fantastic news. And as I said, I'm still working with Health Improvement Scotland, developing um, standards for local care. And also we have the Scottish Obstetric Cardiac Network, which is led by Maggie Simpson, um, who's a very active nurse in all of this. Um, and she also works at Specialist Centre. And that's to improve outcomes for mothers with a cardiac condition. Because in Scotland, there is a higher than 
should be expected maternal death rate um, amongst women with cardiac conditions. And congenital heart disease was also included in the very recent National Heart Disease Strategy for Scotland, which was which is developed by the British Heart Foundation and is proposed to the Scottish Government as a strategy document to lead um, government policy and practice. So just finally, I wanted to mention a book that we have coming out. So this is with my collaborator, uh, Tracy Levecki. And Tracy, like myself, is a pioneering patient. Uh, she's lived with congenital heart condition from birth over near New York in the States. We've never actually met in person, um, but we got in touch about five years ago when she contacted me to ask if she could use the images from our Scar for Life project for the presentation she was giving to the American Congenital Heart Association. Um, and since then, we've kind of discussed the lack of resource for adults like ourselves. Um, and kind of during COVID, we managed to put together a book proposal and get a contract with Oxford University Press. And we're kind of developing this resource at the moment. So, um, yeah, keep your eyes open for that. So just to conclude. Those of us living with a serious lifelong health condition can share a number of disadvantages with other minority groups, including disparities in civil rights, discrimination, income, education, employment, and underrepresentation in the media and politics. And historically, the psychoso psychosocial impact of living with a congenital heart condition has been neglected. And I think that we can and must do better for both pioneering adults um, who live with this legacy and perhaps who, whose needs weren't met growing up, emotional and psychological needs, but also for heart children coming up. And as psychologists, I think that we do have a role to play to disseminate our knowledge um, and advocate for social inclusion, inclusion um, for people who live with 